King Kong 1933, a story about Hollywood fame, adventure, love. I guess I love you. Why, Jack, you hate women. And a giant gorilla who is actually just an 18-inch wire figure covered in cotton and rabbit fur. Cinema had just moved from silent films to talkies, meaning technology and film was still developing and improving its basic fundamentals such as audio, so special effects were limited and simply required lots of effort and creativity. King Kong 1933 was a major pioneer for practical effects in film, displaying the possibilities of a person, a roll of film, and a camera. Willis O'Brien was a special effects pioneer who experimented with stop motion and eventually had claymation comedy shorts funded by Thomas Edison. O'Brien's 1925 film, The Lost World, features many of the same techniques that he had used in King Kong, proving that he had great practice in some practical effects already. His latest project of the time was a stop motion film called Creation, about a ship crew visiting an island full of prehistoric dinosaurs. Sound familiar? This was clearly a pattern of his, considering The Lost World was also about a ship crew visiting an island full of dinosaurs. His ability to refine the movement of these creatures and place real-life people in the same world was incredible. When technology was so limited, these environments and effects were all strictly practical and done with the hands of Willis O'Brien. Without him, King Kong would truly be nothing. O'Brien's creation film was in the works, but unfortunately his team said the story was not good. Luckily for him, Marion C. Cooper had joined the team and was thinking of his next big film, The Beast. Marion C. Cooper was a documentary filmmaker who often worked alongside his best friend, Ernest B. Shodzak. Cooper and Shodzak were two fearless creatives who were fascinated with adventure and war. After meeting during World War II, the two became best friends and channeled their creativity towards documentaries about wild animals. They would get up close to tigers for the sake of their footage. Cooper had become interested in gorillas, and with the help of Shodzak's wife, Ruth Rose, who had experience in writing, the script for The Beast was finalized. While searching for a way to create his monstrous gorilla, Cooper saw O'Brien's creativity and potential for his film. Soon after, O'Brien's creation became King Kong, the Eighth Wonder, using elements of Willis O'Brien's previous ideas. O'Brien's idea for the log scene was reused, his dinosaur figures he created were used for Kong's fight scenes, and even the idea for Skull Island was used. Kong actually had at least three puppets built for the project. Two of the puppets were 18 inches tall, and the other was 24 inches for the New York City scenes in order to make him appear even larger compared to the buildings. They also made a miniature Kong for the long shots of him climbing the Empire State Building, which was also a miniature set. The two 18-inch puppets are recognizable to most. One has a shorter face, and the other is known for his longer face. This is because creating the face was extremely difficult to make it exactly like the other. The figure was a wire skeleton with joints everywhere including his fingers. Cotton was strategically wrapped around the metal skeleton and tied with sewing string to create muscle. A diaphragm was built into his chest so that during production, it would be moved in and out to replicate Kong's motion of breathing. Then he was covered in rabbit fur. In the film, you can see his fur become rustled, which was actually from O'Brien's hands moving the figure between takes. This small error was luckily overshadowed by critics who thought he was amazing, you could see the fur raising on his body. The process of stop motion was incredibly labor intensive. A surface gauge was used to monitor the progress of Kong, as well as create references and key points in his movement. Full-sized robotic figures were also made. Sculptor Marcel Delgado and his brother Victor created an oversized hand and foot and a life-size bust of Kong. This way, the actors could be placed right beside him in close-up shots. Like when we see shots of Anne Darrow in his hand or right next to his face, or when he stomps on the natives when he escapes. Because they had to have live action and stop motion in the same shots, making the film required intense strategy. If one shot included Kong stomping through the city around people, 
This had to be stop motion in O'Brien's studio. But say in the same scene, he picks up Anne and we want to see a close up. This has to be a whole other shot of Anne lying in the giant hand in a whole other studio setting. Can you imagine the shoot schedule and careful planning it took to make this film? Not to mention, working with film for stop motion was incredibly risky and difficult. After development, if there happened to be a mistake in the stop motion, it had to be done all over again. It took lots of patience and skill to do this, but of course Willis O'Brien and his team had what it took. For the set of Skull Island, O'Brien ensured that the scenes carried realistic depth and went above and beyond. The trees were wood covered in clay and tissue paper, the rocks and land were plaster, and the foliage consisted of real plants and thin trimmed copper. All little vines and pieces of leaf were carefully and strategically placed in emphasized detail. Then, a matte painting was placed a few feet behind the set into the background to look like the jungle extended far back. The brightness of the background compared to the foreground made it have a fairy tale like effect, emphasizing the mystifying adventure that Cooper and Shodstack loved. A few feet in front of the set was a giant sheet of glass that was painted with dark shadows of trees. And just a few feet in front of the glass was the camera. This all gave the illusion of a deep and vast jungle. In some shots, such as the airplanes falling from the Empire State Building, they would expose part of a frame of film, then later go over the same roll of film through the camera with an image of the opposite side exposed. This gave the look of superimposition. Another simple technique included the dunning process, where blue and yellow lighting was filtered onto the black and white background and foreground, so that the background appeared transparent. Two strips of film were then loaded into the camera at the same time, so that the film is placed on top of a stop-motion scene. This places live-action characters into a stop-motion scene. Of course, this is such a risky technique. If any of these techniques mess up, this means that the entire roll of film is ruined and it all has to be redone. To perhaps solve this issue, a man named Lynn Dunn approached RKA Studios with the Williams process, which uses an optical printer, a projector, and a camera. They are all played in sync so that everything is combined into one image on film. This technique was mainly first used in King Kong as a way for Lin Dunn to prove its effectiveness. It ended up being a success as it prevented the risk of losing entire rolls of film. Both the Dunning and the Williams process were basically just techniques of green screening before they even had the proper technology for it. A major technique used, which was quite easier, was done by using a rear screen projector. After the stop motion scene was done accordingly, the finished product would be projected onto a translucent screen from behind. In front of the projector would be the actors. This way, the actors could directly react to exactly what is seen in front of them. This was used in the scene where the film crew throws a grenade at the Stegosaurus. They were able to perfectly time the throw, then watch the effects happen in front of them. Another includes the scene where Anne Darrow watched Kong and the T-Rex fight from the tree. Because this included her reaction, the rear projector technique was perfect to help make the scene look as genuine as possible. They also used a projector technique, which was a miniature projection on the stop motion sets. Basically, a tiny projection screen was built into the stop motion set and the live action actors were projected from the back, just like the giant rear projector technique. Because the stop motion consisted of pictures, each frame of the live action film was screened on the mini projector. That way when played, both live action and the stop motion are occurring smoothly and naturally in the same shot and Kong could interact with the projection. There was also a fan present to prevent overheating of the set from the projector's heat. If they wanted Kong to walk behind the projection, the projector was turned to the side and a mirror was placed diagonally across, which would project the same image on the projector from the back. This allowed Kong to get behind the projection on the set without getting in the way of the projection itself and creating a shadow. These projection techniques got extremely intricate, such as the scene where Anne Darrow and the other man are two separate projections in the same shot. These type of techniques were used and mixed around throughout the film to give variety, which only emphasized the skill of the practical effects. A 3-4 to four inch figure of Anne was used for the scenes where Kong was holding her. However, when he would place her down, such as in this well-known scene, you can see his hand go in front of the projection as the figure disappears and becomes the live-action actress. Another impressive scene was when Kong was holding Anne and begins playing with her clothes. First, they filmed Anne sitting in the giant gorilla hand. 
Then, in production for the stop motion, they projected the footage of Anne and the hand behind the stop motion figure of Kong. This way, it looked like his arm was behind him, looking extremely natural. When he takes the garment off of Anne, they cut in Kong holding a cloth piece and used wire to tear off the clothes in the live action footage. Or when Kong is peering through the window, they use the rear projection technique, then move the giant robotic hand in through the side window all in one shot. On top of all these complicated techniques, O'Brien's ability to bring Kong to life may be one of the most memorable parts of the film for audiences. Willis O'Brien understood that while Kong was a monster who terrorized the city, he was still a gorilla with monkey instincts. Such as the incredibly intense and amazing Kong vs. T-Rex scene, which took seven weeks to do. After Kong kills the T-Rex, he begins to playfully move around the jaw. This was the innocence that O'Brien created in Kong, helping audiences realize that he is really just an animal. Another cute scene was when the snake began approaching Anne, who we can see is a mini projection. Kong is taking the time to pick up a flower and admire it. Then, when he hears a noise behind him, he immediately is called to attention and goes to protect Anne. O'Brien knew exactly what he was doing and brought forth an entirely new layer to Kong's character, even though he was literally just a stop-motion figure. Audiences are able to empathize with him being taken out of his home. You start to despise the film crew using Kong for their own gain and fortune by selfishly and senselessly bringing him out of his environment and into a situation where people are flashing their cameras at him. The film looks more into the morality of showcasing animals for profit as well as the deeper parts of Kong's character, such as his love for Anne. At the end and in Kong's final moment, the music stops for a moment and you realize that you see him as less of a monster and more as a loving animal who wants love and affection and was pulled from his home and punished for acting like the animal he is. His dramatic fall to his death can serve more as a lesson and can make an audience cry because of the deep connection they had learned to develop with Kong during the film. Oh no, it wasn't the airplanes. It was beauty killed the beast. Willis O'Brien's techniques for King Kong were so groundbreaking that it earned him a patent. His persistence and skill alongside Cooper and Shodzak's brilliant story and creativity ended up being one of the most incredible and notable films in history, especially for its time. The careful detail, advanced technique, and passion put into the creation of King Kong makes it one of a kind even today. The charm of this film is that even though it was made in 1933, audiences can still watch it in complete awe and wonder how in the world this film was even made. Today where CGI is used for ease, films can lose the amazement and creativity that we see in King Kong. If there's any movie that fully displayed and took advantage of the numerous possibilities of film without the intense technology that we see today, it would be this film. King Kong 1933 truly has a heart and soul and will continue to amaze and inspire special effects artists and audiences until the end of time. No one can possibly forget the iconic image of Kong on top of the Empire State Building. It symbolized capital civilization today, morality, love, and also the power of film when it's in the right hands.